We'll be continuing our study today through the Gospels. Uh, we'll be in Matthew chapter 5. Uh, we've been off a couple weeks because of the fifth Sunday and uh, another Sunday I felt the Lord was leading me to teach something else. But we're in Matthew chapter 5. Just to give a quick recap on, on Matthew chapter 5 and the, and the Sermon on the Mount, uh, when, when it comes to the Bible, the longest uh, sermon, if you want to call it a sermon, where uh, uh, there was something that was actually spoken to people. Jesus didn't sit here and write these things down as he was, as he was speaking it out, if you will. Right? This was not meant to be a letter, uh, but it was meant to be a teaching. Right? It, was, it was a straight-up teaching. It wasn't like Paul's letters, if you will, where he would write things to people and you know, tell them to abide by it. Uh, and, and the reason it's different is because it, it's just different when you talk to people, right? It's different when you've when you got a crowd in front of you uh, and people are sitting there watching. And Jesus said that he, that he saw the multitudes, right? He saw all the multitudes there following him in, in uh, chapter 5 and verse 1. It says that he went up on the mountain and when he was seated, um, his disciples came to him, right? So this was basically more for his disciples than anybody, right? And what is that, what is that telling you? Uh, of, of all the people that were following Christ, his disciples were the ones that were chosen, if you will, uh, to, do, to carry on his work, right? Now, that's why the Sermon on the Mount is going to apply to Christians, right? This sermon is for Christians. It was meant for a specific people or for a specific audience, right? One of the t- things they tell you in a speech class in, in college or, or in high school, whenever you take a speech class, and they say one of the first things you're supposed to do when you get up to give a speech or you get up to, to teach is to consider your audience. Think about who you're teaching to, right? You don't, I can't just sit here and... Uh, and, and I remember I took a biology class in, in college a while back, and I remember the language of biology and all that scientific language. I just I didn't speak it, goodness sakes. It took me a while to get, to get up to par with that. But the hardest thing about that class was trying to understand what the teacher was saying, We're using all the scientific lingo, and, and goodness, I, thought, I didn't think I was going to do well in that class. Thankfully, I passed it. But at the same time, I understand the reasoning behind that, but when it, when it comes to giving a, a teaching or a, you're talking to somebody or whatever, you've got to con- think about who you're talking to. You can't just speak in one way, and the, but your audience just is not there, right? So when Jesus looks out at his, his disciples, you know, he's going to consider his audience and, and who he's talking to. So he sits down. He's going to talk to his disciples. We get the Beatitudes there in verses 3 through 10, right? Blessed are they. Blessed are all those. You know, happy is this person. Um, blessed are even those that are persecuted, those that are uh, uh, being persecuted for the Lord. Uh, then we went into the part about being salt and light for the Lord, you know, letting your light shine, you know, and, and, and the things that we do in our life, whether you think so or not, are, are people are going to notice. We we're talking about that a little bit in Sunday school. People notice it. People notice the things that you do. Right. I've even heard about the things that people notice that, that some other people do. I don't like to hear that. But at the same time, I've, I've heard had people come up to me. Did you see this? Like, oh, I, you know, hang on a minute. You know, but at the same time, people notice the things that we do, whether you want them to or not. Right. And then in verse 17, we start talking about how Christ interpreted the law, right? How the law was originally given out in the Old Testament and how it was being misconstrued and twisted and, and all these different things by the Pharisees. It was being made less, basically. We talked about the purpose of the law. The purpose of the law was not to make sure that we do right, but to show us how horrible we are, right? What are you talking about? We got a law because we can't keep it. That was the point of it. The law was there to show that we can't keep it. That was the whole point of it. And then when Jesus came to fulfill the law, he came to fulfill the law and say, hey, you can't, you can't keep the law. You're not perfect, but I'm here to show you a way out. The perfect, per, perfect son of God is going gonna, is gonna to die on the cross, shed his blood, and, and provide a way out, right, which is salvation. Right? That's how he came to fulfill the law. He showed us first that we can't keep the law, that we're all going to hell, but I'm going to provide a way out. Right? That's what Jesus' actions were. Right? Now we, uh, we move, we're moving. Uh, we talked about murder in your heart, but now we're down in 27. That's just a quick recap since we've been off a couple weeks. Um, we're down in... in uh, Verse 27 here, a bit of a, can be a touchy subject, you know, but, you know, this is, we're at in the Bible, um, we're going to talk about it. Verse 27 there says, uh, you have heard it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. And that's, that's not necessarily something that's hard to, uh, hard to think on, if you will. But uh, before we go any further, let's go ahead and pray. Dear Lord, as we come to you in prayer, bless your word, Father, bless our hearts as we understand. I pray, Lord, that you'll help us see what you want us to see today. And uh, Lord, I pray that just, it'll be something we add to our lives, Lord, and to make us more godly. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so verse 27 again says, You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. Now, that's an easy one. That's an easy one. Thou shalt not murder. I've never murdered anybody, right? When Jesus said, uh, you're not supposed to be mur- we're not supposed to murder people. That's, you know, we know that. But then God said, even if you have a hatred or there was some, there's something in your heart that, that causes you to, to really dislike somebody else, right? A hatred for somebody else in your heart, you might not act on it. Right. But just the fact that you're harboring that dislike 
that, that extreme dislike for somebody else, guess what? In God's eyes, you guess what he's saying? It's the same thing as killing somebody. The only thing you haven't done is murdered, has committed the action. But in the Lord's eyes, if there's intent in your heart in any such way, you're, the Lord says you're already guilty of it. Right? You're not, we're not only guilty of our actions. We need to, as Christians, we need to understand it's not just our actions that, hold, that God's going to hold us accountable for. When we look all the way back uh, in the book of Genesis, before the rains came, the floods came, and the Lord wanted to destroy the earth because of all the sin of mankind. What did he say? He didn't say the actions of men are sinful continually, did he? He said the hearts and the thoughts of men are sin, sinful continually. They're constantly sinning in their hearts and minds, and that's what made the Lord want to bring the flood about. Right, so we need to uh, get that out of our, of our minds that it's only actions that we're going to be held accountable for. It's so much more than that. Right? It's going to be our thoughts. It's going to be the things that we put into our heart. So now we're going to talk about adultery in our heart. In our society, we talk about adultery as, as it's something that we do. I've heard this saying before, and I hate it. It doesn't hurt to look. Right? It doesn't hurt to look. What's wrong with looking? What's wrong with flirting? And, you know, what's wrong with all that stuff? There's, there's so much wrong with that. Because why? Not only are you acting on something... Right, that, that some could ba basically consider innocent, but you've already put it in your heart that it's a, it, that's all right. You know, I, I, can, I can look. It's, there's nothing wrong with that. But then what's the Bible say here in verse 20, 28? This is Jesus talking. It's not Paul. And uh, it, this is Christ himself telling his disciples. He says, but I tell you, I say to you that whosoever looks at a woman to lust for her um, uh, has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Men, I'm a guy. I can't really talk, talk to women about this kind of thing. Women's minds are weird. I, I hate to say it. Y'all don't, don't work the same way, and I don't understand it. I've, I've only been married uh, coming on 15 years, but I, I don't get it sometimes. I don't get uh, I don't get it. All right? Been, <laughs> so we all understand the frustration. We do our best, men. That's what we can do. Right? And we, we love them as best we can. But it's hard. Women, it, it can be hard. So I won't really address the woman side of this. Maybe, maybe a little bit. Uh, but men, it says, when we look at, look at a woman, um, it says, uh, but I say to you, whosoever looks at a woman, right, there's not the sin. The sin is not the looking, okay? Let me, let me clear that up. But it says, looks at a woman to lust. If you look at a woman in order to provoke something in your mind, to provoke some kind of reaction in your brain, right, there, there's, there's where the sin starts. You've looked at a woman in order to gain some kind of self-satisfaction in your mind. There's where the sin starts. To look, now this, now this is something that many people argue over. To look, and, and if you all disagree with me, fine. Uh, I, I, a good friend in, 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 in Washington State said this one time. He said, he said men, sometimes you're going to notice things you probably shouldn't notice. But he said, it's what you do with what you've noticed after that is what, is what determines whether it becomes a sin or not. Men, uh, how many of y'all in here like hunting? I know y'all like hunting. Okay, I expect more. Okay, here we go. Here we go. All right, I know, I know some of y'all in here like hunting. What does it take, though? Do you hunt with your eyes closed? No, you don't, right? Back in the olden days, when it came time to go dating, what'd you do? You were scanning the crowd, weren't you? You kind of looked around. You, you, that's, just, that's how guys remain, right? So when I, the reason I bring this up, because when you notice something, men, you're gonna, your eyes are going to be drawn to things. Women, I hope you have patience with your husband. If you don't, smack him. I don't care, right? <laughs> guys, you, we all need more discipline. I will say that straight up in front. We do. But at the same time, there are times, men, I'm just talking to men at this point. There are times when you do your, you do your best, you don't want to look at anything. You don't want garbage in because you don't want garbage coming out. You don't want to put nothing. But sometimes something just pops into your, uh, your, your sight line and you just can't help it, right? But it's what you do with it afterwards, right? Do you let that continue to pull you, if you will, towards sin, towards lusting? Or do you just kind of look the other way and just kind of try to keep on going? And the reason why I bring up hunting is because when you're out there hunting, what are you looking for? You're looking for movement. Right? You're looking for movement. You're looking for things that are going to draw the eye. Right? That, that's the whole point of hunting. That's what you're doing. Men, we, we tend to be wired in this way. and it just, That's just how the Lord made us. But at the same time, just because we're wired a certain way, it is not an excuse to abuse the way the Lord has made us. That, there's no excuse to do that. Right? You look at something you're not supposed to be looking at, man, look off somewhere else. Right? Do your best. Let your eyes, I heard one preacher say, let your eyes bounce off of it like a basketball. There it goes. Boom. Bounce it off. You know? Continue on another direction. It's men, it's what we do with it. The, Bible, the sin is, here isn't the looking or the noticing, right? And I'm, not, I'm, I'm going back to it, uh, uh, what I just said a second ago. It doesn't hurt to look, right? If, if you happen to notice, then okay, whatever. But it's what you do with it afterwards that you start falling into sin, right? That's how you start committing adultery in your heart. That's when it, you start getting in your heart and you let it start getting in there. Uh, James, chapter one, or James chapter 1 or 2 tells us that temptation starts when, when your heart starts desiring something else, that, uh, something other than what the Lord wants for you. 
Temptation doesn't necessarily start because you're in a situation where you might possibly sin. Temptation starts is when your heart starts to wonder a little bit, saying, wonder what it would be like to do this. That's when temptation, that's when the battle really starts, right? But if you keep yourself in the battle uh, if, as best you can, just like what that preacher said, let your eyes just bounce off of it and, and go on somewhere else. Don't give yourself time. Let something else pop in your head. I heard, I heard one guy say that what he does to help himself is that as soon as he starts to feel himself start to, his mind starts to slip towards lust, he starts singing to him. He starts singing to him in his head. Amazing grace, right? You know, try, try lusting and singing amazing grace in your mind. That's, I hope you can't do that. Goodness sake, right? <laughs> amazing grace or how great thou art. But that's the way you got to roll with it. Man, ladies, if, if their eyes pop down for a second and, and, and they bounce off whatever they weren't supposed to be looking at, pray for them, please. It's, it's not necessarily easy. But it's saying, now if they start to linger, you all the ladies know your husband better. If your ladies notice your husband's look is lingering, go ahead and smack him. You're doing, you're doing him a favor, okay? All right? Uh, don't call the cops, guys, and start talking about you know, abuse. But I say that jokingly. But at the same time, you know, husbands and wife, we are accountable to each other in the church, but you all are accountable to each other first, before the church. Right? Men, be humble towards your wives. If they got a correction, you better listen to it. Okay? We've, we've talked about that before. Ladies, as best you can, listen to your husbands too. Right? We don't always talk intelligently, but sometimes things come out. You know, sometimes the sun shines on what we say. You know? so, but anyway, um, don't lust. Careful what you look at. All right? Somebody say garbage in, garbage out. You let stuff start coming into your mind, that stuff's going to get on your heart. Book of Proverbs, uh, I'll just read this, uh, 4.23. Proverbs 4.23 says, Keep your heart with all diligence. For out, of it, uh, for out of it springs the issues of life. Now, what's the point of that? All right? What happens? What's the purpose? What, what, it hurt, what does it hurt to look? You know, going back to that silly saying. We've got to guard our hearts because the things that, the, the things that come into our, to our eyes will get into our minds if we're not careful. We look at something. If I look at that, back, that door back there and I look towards the back of the church, one of the first things my eyes are drawn to is, is the clock. Okay? We've got, you know, we got a couple minutes left. We've got about, uh, uh, about 15, 20 minutes left, right? That's going through my mind as I'm talking. And also, I notice the door's open. CW's back there. I don't, I don't know. He's got his hands in front of his face. You know, but it's little things like that you notice. You know, when you're looking out there and, and you kind of gauge the reaction of the crowd, there's a lot of things that can pass through your mind while you're doing something else. Okay, and that's the point. And if you, if, as I'm thinking about those things, as I look at it, I start to think about it. You know, I, I, it's just how your mind works. Man, if you look at something you're not supposed to, if you're not careful, you're going to start thinking about it. And the more you, you, the more you, let those two things reciprocate and cycle through back and forth. What I'm looking at, I'm thinking about. What, what, the more you do that, the things are going to start becoming part of who you are, and they're going to start affecting your behavior. All right? they're going to, so you're, that's how you write things on your heart. We've talked about that before. So we have to be careful of what we look at. We've got to be careful of what we listen to. Because if we, we let that relationship, if you will, continue between our eyes and whatever is out there, and, and whatever's out there is not pure and it's not righteous, uh, then what's going to happen is it's, it's going to start becoming part of who we are. It's going to start affecting our behavior because whatever's in your heart is going to affect how you behave, right? Or, or it's going to be a great wrestling match between, between your logical sense and, and your, your mind and, and your heart. And so the reason why the Bible here says keep your heart with all diligence. Keep your heart, right? Keeping your heart doesn't just start with uh, uh, taking your vitamins, right? But it, the other things that the, the Bible's considering here is the things that we look at. We just got, uh, you got to, got to, don't let garbage in. Don't, don't look at things you're not supposed to. Keep yourself pure. Be righteous. Don't listen to things you're not supposed to be listening to. Okay? And, and y'all make that decision um, between you and the Lord for the most part. All right? Unless it just gets too crazy out there. Because why? It says, for out of it springs the issues of life. Out of your heart comes who you are. All right? If I see somebody walking in here all slumped over and sad and looking defeated, you know something's really affected their heart. Right? They might not be able to help it. They might not be able to help that, that life has just beat them down this past week. And that's just, that's just their countenance. But guess what? I can, anybody can see that. Something's wrong with their heart. You know, that, that, that's, that's what I'm talking about. We've got to guard our hearts with all diligence. Be diligent in it, even in the smallest things. Don't fall into that trap of a, a look doesn't hurt. You know, what do you think about this? I remember one time as a kid, I used to, go, I used to just walk with my dad to the gym. I used to walk to the gym when I was really young. And um, I remember one time he walked in there. People knew he was a preacher, and sometimes they'd mess with him. And one time they held up this calendar, and they asked him, what do you think about this? And he just, first thing he did was just didn't even acknowledge it. It's completely ignored it. And maybe it's because I was, I don't know. I was there. I remember thinking to my dad, like, you know, what's he doing? I remember I was about to smack my dad's leg, you know. But I just remember my dad kind of looked up, took off the other direction, just went about his workout, right? But at the same time, just, just that, that split second, you might make that decision. What are you going to do, right? What are you going to do? Keep your heart with all diligence. In 2 Samuel uh, 2.11, let's turn there. That's a neat story. 2 Samuel 2.11, all the way back in the Old Testament. This is a famous story because this is a... Uh, Probably, goodness, 
it's a, it's a pretty it's a story about adultery, but it goes into a lot of detail of the, of the heart of David, how deep you can you can sink into it if you're not careful, how deep you can trying to justify actions. Second Samuel two eleven, it says, um, verse one there it says it happened in the spring of the year at that time when the kings go out to battle. Right, so David was supposed to be out the battle. The kings go out the battle, but what was David doing? David sent Joab instead, his his top general. All right, David, you're supposed to be out there with your with your men doing battle, but here you are uh, lounging. You sent Joab instead, and his servants with them, and all Israel, and they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. David's being lazy. He'd say it. All right, but there he is. Then it happened at one evening that David rose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And when it says walked here, this is not like a walk like. I just walked up there to take a breath of fresh air and walk down. This, this walk gives a sense that he was up there pacing. Right? He was up there pacing. For whatever reason, he was up there pacing on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof, he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. Now, first question in the guy's mind, what in the world is she on the roof bathing for? I, I don't know. Um, in, in some cultures, it is that way. Uh, it's the way it is. And, and where we lived in Peru, uh, way up in the mountains, all the houses had flat roofs. They had flat roofs, and that's just how it was. That's where people took their baths because the water tank was on the roof. The sun would shine down on the water tank and heat the water up, and that, that's where they would take their baths. Right? I don't know how it was here, but, uh, but generally I'll say this. The only people that did that is because their house was higher than everybody else's house. Right? You didn't see a single-story home doing the same thing, people out there bathing and stuff. Right? You didn't see that. They would be out somewhere else, and they, or they would cover it. Right? But whatever reason, she's out there bathing, um, and from Ruth, he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. So David sent, okay? Here we, here we start getting in there. What did he do, right? Here we get the, the, the moment of truth, if you will, the moment where David could have changed history, literally, right? He could have just went back downstairs and said, okay, it's not a good time to be up here pacing and, and thinking. But what did he do? Man, he started thinking about, what can I do here? What can we do to, uh, to, to, to start something up with this woman? So he sent and said and inquired about the woman. He doesn't even know who she is. He wants to send. He wants to figure out who she is. Um, he sent and inquired about the woman. Someone said, is this is not Bathsheba, the daughter, daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Now, Uriah the Hittite was one of David's most, most faithful men, right? if not the most loyal, one of the most loyal to David, one of David's mighty men. David, as you all know the story, he completely betrayed uh, uh, his, his, his man there, Uriah, um, took Bathsheba to wife, had Uriah killed. I mean, it's just a messed up story. But what did it start with? What did it start? No one can say that it started with he, David was being held down with his eyes taped open. Nobody could say that, right? It all started with the look. It all started with the look. And that's, that's what we're talking about this morning. You've got to be careful of the things you look at. Though, so many mistakes can start with just the look. Conversation. Man, we've got to guard ourselves. You've got to guard yourself. Wait, where it goes. But Jesus is telling us, But I say to you that whosoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Verse 9 says, If, if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish, then for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off, um, cut it off from you, for it is profitable for you that one of your members should perish, then for your whole body to be cast into hell. Now what is this talking about? Is this talking about if you fell into sin or this is something you struggle with that you're supposed to go pluck your eyes out, right? No, no, it's not what it's saying. Although there have been Christians in the past that have done this. There was a, uh, one of the Christian forefathers that was very extreme in this, um, his name was Origen, I think, believe it or not. Origen, I think, is what his name was. But this is what this guy would do. Whenever he'd have a weakness or something like this, guess what he'd do? He'd go chop things off. Right? He, was, he took this stuff seriously. He was nuts about it. But this is not what the Bible's telling us. I'll, I'll tell you right away. You know, I don't want to see nobody come back like Kenny. Kenny, where you at? Right? Got his hand all cut up. Nobody come to church next week. With, you know, because you I don't know. Right? You're killing bugs, ants with your, with your fingers. So, man, look, I'm killing God's creation. You cut your finger off. We don't, we don't want that happening. That's not what this is saying. What the, the grand scheme of this is saying is sometimes you might need to sacrifice the things that are causing you to sin, right? So the Bible talks about that we're supposed to put off not all, only the sins from our lives, but also the weights, the things that are weighing us down. Not all the weights are going to be sins, right? Now, now what am I talking about? Now, there's some people that can go out there and let me, let me think of something. Some people could, uh, um, good example. Some things just aren't not good in your life. Okay, okay, here's a good one, right? I like Mountain Dew. Oh, man, I like Mountain Dew. What, I used to go out and buy, um, especially on a three- or four-day weekend, I would go out and buy a case of Mountain Dew just for myself. My roommate touched it. We were going to be fighting. Right? I like Mountain Dew. I just, I do. Right? So I do. I do like Mountain Dew, right? <laughs> but I would drink that whole case of Mountain Dew in a weekend. That, that's a lot of Mountain Dew to go through. And it didn't affect me whatsoever. I was fine. Didn't gain no weight. <laughs> it was a blessing from the Lord. 
man, that was a great time, all right? One of the best times in life. Eat not to worry about gaining weight. But you know what? Anymore, if I, if I fall into drinking one or two, even sodas, two or three, four or five a week, man, I start noticing it. It makes me feel sleepy. It's just not good. Now, is Mountain Dew a sin? Here's your question. Mountain Dew a sin? No, not really. I don't care if you drink Mountain Dew, right? Go drink Mountain Dew. Go drink whatever you want to drink. I mean, drink your sodas. I don't care, right? But if you go off and start drinking 20 of them, there's going to be something detrimental to it, okay? Now, there might be somebody else down the street that's 30 years younger or whatever, and they can drink all the Mountain Dew they want. It's not a weight to them, right? The Bible says to put off the weights, the things that are weighing you down, because they're going to, they're going to mess with your Christian life. That's what the Bible is saying. Now, what, that's sacrifice, and I had to give up Mountain Dew. I might have one every now and again, but I don't drink a whole case of it anymore. <laughs> that's hard. When I go to the store and I see Mountain I really do. I, there's a draw to it for me. I like it, all right? But now I have to give that up. What does that mean? I had to sacrifice my Mountain Dew. All right, for my, my own benefit, for my health. All right? and, and that's a very light example of what Christ is talking about here. There are things that we sometimes we have to do in order to make sure that we, that we stay, if you will, within, uh, walking with the Lord. There are things that, that we might do in life that might pull us away. All right? There are things that we might do. Uh, one of the, we got rid of our rental properties. You all know we had rental properties. Man, those things are weighing us down. I'm telling you, we were actually ready to get rid of them anyway. But at the same time, what if we would have been too proud or, or just wanted to hold on to them for whatever reason? Or we're going to hold on to them anyway. We can do it. We can, we can maintain our life up here and manage those things from afar. Man, that would be a weight. Is it a, is it a sin to have rental property? No. Right? If that's, if that's how the Lord directs your life, then fine. Then do it. But when it, comes, when it starts weighing your life down and starts being a detriment to your Christian walk, that's when you need to start getting rid of it. That's the sacrifice that you have to make. What did Jesus do when he was out, out in the wilderness? Here's a little more extreme version. Would it, would it have been a sin for him to eat bread because he was hungry? No. But what did he do? He sacrificed the bread for something greater. What did he say? He said, what is good for me right now is not this bread. What is good for me right now is the word of God. Because he said, man does not live by bread alone, but by the word of God, right? He sacrificed the bread. That's a pretty extreme example. But he sacrificed the bread in order for something bigger, right? The same thing when, when Satan was offering these other things. What did he denied it. He said, no, that is not good for me. Is it a sin to be a ruler of the kings of the world? No. Is it a sin to have all these other things and uh, uh, to do things that might risk? I don't, I don't know about that one. Let me back up on that one. When, when, when Satan told him, if you throw yourself off this, 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 this high place here, the angels are going to tell you, or they're going to they're catch you because they won't let you dash your foot against a stone. Remember that temptation? Right? Well, Jesus, Jesus didn't do it. Right? He didn't, uh, didn't succumb to any of these temptations. But the reason why I say I back myself up because... I think about thrill seekers. Anybody, anybody here ever been a thrill seeker? Yeah, Mike. There we go. All right, Donnie. All right. I don't, I'm not alone here. I used to go cliff jumping and jumping off bridges and stuff. And motorcycles, goodness sakes. That's I, I get hit on motorcycle. Obviously, y'all know. But I used to be a thrill seeker. So now, I, the reason I backtrack myself is it a sin to go thrill seeking to put your life in danger? I don't know. There's a question for y'all. I'm not about to start talking about that. That popped in my head. Because that's what Jesus was. Telling, that's what the devil was telling Jesus. Throw yourself in this high place. You know, uh, what was the devil's intent? I don't know. Was it thrill seeking? Did Jesus have a problem with thrill seeking? I don't know. It makes me kind of wonder now. Um, but anyway, Pat, skipping that one. What the devil offered? I will give you all these things of the world. You know, you can rule over all this stuff. Is there a sin in being the president of the United States or a senator? No, right. But is it going to affect your Christian life? There's there's the catch. When Jesus says here, if your right eye causes you to sin. If your job causes you to sin, if your car causes you to sin because you can't keep it under the speed limit or you're driving recklessly, if, if, uh, if, if you got so many, I don't know, if you got so many horses that you can't uh, uh, get to church ever, you know, yeah, you, I might have a horse sick every now and again. You might have to stay, I understand that. But if it's keep taking you away from your Christian life, uh, if, if, if your shoes are making you prance around like a peacock because you're so proud of them and you want to show everybody else how much better you are, you know, don't get the shoes. You know, that's what it's talking about. Give these things up. Because, you know, how bad would it be for the Lord to have to come down on you because you want to hold on to these shoes, so now the Lord's going to have to bring about correction uh, and, and chastisement in your life. Nobody wants that. And that's what this is talking about. But Jesus is using a very extreme example in order to, to show that, guess what? Everything else that falls up under this, every example that you can come up with that's less extreme still applies. Anything that's going to drag you away from the Christian life, you need to get rid of it, right? And again, we're not commanded to be poking each other's eyes out and, and cutting fingers off. That's not what it's saying. We have to learn to sacrifice things. The Lord will pay you back. He'll pay you back. You'll be blessed for sacrificing things. If you feel like you have to give up something uh, because it's messing with your Christian life, then the Lord will bless you for that. He will not, that is one thing that I know the Lord is going to bless you, bless you for. Giving up stuff isn't easy. Right? Giving up things is, is, is not easy. I used to, goodness, you all saw my car when I first got here. Giving that thing up, well, I'll be honest with you guys. Some of you all that are motorhead, it was a little bit hard to give that thing up. 
I like that. I like my little car. But at the same time, you know, going out to visit some, some of our shut-ins, you know, bottoming that thing out, you know, in the yard and getting stuck, it's not very, that's kind of embarrassing, actually. Getting stuck in somebody's yard when you've gone to visit. Now it's been covered in mud. You know, so it was prudent for me to get a vehicle that's a little, uh, you know, uh, a little bit more conducive, if you will. Uh, and that's fine. I, I look back and I, I'm, fi- I'm completely fine with it. But at the same time, if, if something ever happened in the, uh, in the future where we had a garage with three garage bays, all right, and we had a little bit of extra money, I might, I might go back down that road and get me another sports car. I'll be honest with you. But at the same time, I won't, I won't be making the excuse, well, I can't visit that person because my car won't make it. Now, you know how silly that'd be, right? That'd be silly. Goodness sake. But at the same time, when you give up things for the Lord, he's going to bless you. Will I ever get a car again? I don't know. Maybe in the millennium I'll have a 18 million horsepower car. I don't know. Whatever. But my point is the Lord will bless you for giving stuff up. Right? Maybe the blessing comes and, and, and just the contentment that you feel uh, on the other side. Contentment is not a cheap thing. Contentment is not something that everybody feels. And contentment is a blessing. When the Lord gives you peace in your heart over a situation, man, that's a blessing in and of itself. All right? So maybe that's just a blessing. But either way, when you give something up, the Lord's going to bless you for it. In one way or the other, you don't have to worry about it. You, you will get something back uh, for the things that you give up. Right? There's many examples of that in the Bible. If the right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. And again, just sacrifice. Sacrifice. I know, I know some of y'all out there, and maybe some of y'all don't know that I know this. Right? But I know some of y'all out there do things for other people that it just, you take your own time. You, you, some, of, some of the actions you do for other people require a lot of, a lot of sweat and time and work. You know, and I appreciate that. You know, you, but you sacrifice your time to give to others. You know? And that's what this, these two verses are talking about. You know, everything that falls up under the... Anyway, I know I'm talking about a lot. Don't poke your eyes out, okay, y'all? Don't come next week and the eye patch is on and look at my Kenny, you know, back there with his hand all wrapped up. You know, but, but don't forget the sacrifice for the Lord. If it's drawing you away from your Christian life, you don't need it, right? The Lord will bless you for getting rid of it. All right. I think we're good. We're good, I don't... Good, thanks. It's been a good week, y'all. It's been a good week. I pray, I pray that y'all will have a good week. Pray one for another. Our, our normal homework, as we always do, is, you know, look around the room. Find somebody to pray for. All right, Lord will put, their, put them in your head. But we're going to go ahead and sing a, a couple of stanzas. The Lord's leading you to whatever. Come forward and talk about anything. You know, uh, one of the reasons we, we have invitation is because there's security here. Nobody's going to be judging. Come forward because you've got some problem in your life. Somebody's going to be judging. You know what's going to happen is people are going to pray for you. All right? It's better to have a bunch of people praying for you than, than just a few. And it's just numbers. That's the Bible talks about that. The prayer of righteous man availeth much. The prayer of righteous men availeth even more. All right? So, you know, it's good to have people praying for you. Uh, but we'll go ahead and sing a, a stanza of invitation. Thank you all for being here today. Hope you all have a great week this week. Pray that the Lord will guide each and every step you take this week. I pray that, goodness, don't forget the, what the choir told us this morning. 
Keep that in your minds today. Keep t- whatever you do, just sit here and think about how great the Lord is. Look at the tree outside and put, let that thought cross your mind. How great is the Lord? Look at the tree. That'll make you look at things a little bit differently. All right? Oh, goodness. You ever look at, you ever look at trees? All this stuff? Goodness, y'all. Here we go. We start another sermon. You ready? All right? Oh, I pray that, just keep that in your mind this week. You know, pray blessings one for another. Pray that the Lord will keep one, uh, each other. All right? Uh, if I could ask, uh, Tommy, could you dismiss us in prayer, please? Dear Lord, please bless this service and let us use it.